Hey everyone, Brandon Lee here with Virtualization How To. And over the years, my home lab has gone through a ton of changes. And I've rebuilt it, I've reconfigured it, I've upgraded it more times than I can possibly count. Most of those upgrades were small tweaks, adding RAM here, swapping out a switch there. There have been a few that have truly transformed everything about how I build, manage, and enjoy my home lab. Today, I want to take you through the five upgrades that changed everything in my home lab. These are the ones that took my setup from just being functional to something that actually feels enterprise grade. So stick around and let's dive into my top home lab upgrades that took my home lab to the next level and I think will take yours there as well. So the first home lab upgrade that made a massive difference was moving to 10 gig networking. I can't overstate enough how big of a leap this truly was. Before 10 gig ethernet, I was using gigabit networking and it was just good enough. File copies took forever, it seemed like. Shared storage was sluggish and vMotion or live migrations between hosts felt like watching paint dry. Once though, I added a 10 gig switch and the 10 gig ethernet cards to make that possible, everything changed. Things like moving virtual machines between hosts became lightning fast, ISO uploads flew by, and my shared storage, both iSCSI as well as NFS storage started performing like it does in an enterprise. Now also adding 10 gig networking opened the door to experiment with software defined storage, which was something I'd never been able to do realistically before that. Things like VMware vSAN, as well as the open source Ceph HCI storage. Those workloads just don't perform well when you have one gig networking and having the bigger backbone of 10 gig made the huge difference that I really needed. I could finally scale my home lab use software defined networking, push my network infrastructure harder without being bottlenecked by the network like I was with one gig. And when I made that first move, it was expensive, especially about five, six, seven years ago, but that's really not the case anymore. 10 gig ethernet is now actually very affordable for home labs. And a great example of a really nice switch is the Microtik CRS 309 1G 8S IN switch. It's an eight port, SFP plus switch with one gig uplink and it runs around $239 and you'll find a link to that switch in the description. Now once you make the jump to 10 gig networking, you'll never go back. It's really not a luxury anymore in my personal opinion. It's a requirement if you're running multiple hosts, shared storage, or just want to feel your lab performs like it would in the enterprise. Now two and a half gig multi-gig networking is definitely great and it's a step up for sure from one gig ethernet. However, 10 gig is just hard to get away from once you feel the raw power and bandwidth that you get from that. Now moving from full servers to mini PCs for virtualization nodes was the second Second big upgrade that allowed me to take my home lab to the next level. Now, at first glance, it may sound like a downgrade to mini PCs, but in reality, is one of the best changes that I have made in my home lab. I used to run enterprise super micro servers in my home lab, and they were solid. They were reliable. Even with the Xeon D processors, they drew actually a ton of power and generated a lot of heat. Now, when I started looking into mini PCs, I was definitely skeptical. Could these small form factor machines really handle true enterprise virtualization workloads? Now, over the past few years, mini PCs have absolutely exploded in capabilities. Many of the models now with DDR5 memory support 128 gigs of RAM. They have multiple NVMe slots and they feature multi-core Ryzen or Intel processors. They're fast, they're efficient, and incredibly quiet. So I've been running mini PCs as my main virtualization nodes for about three and a half years now, and they have definitely been rock solid. 
Now, a couple of my favorites for mini PCs are the Minisform MSA2, which is an AMD-based Ryzen 9 processor-based mini PC, and the mini PC I reviewed on the last video, the Mini X Elite EU715 AI, which uses an Intel-based processor. Now, I've reviewed many mini PCs on this channel as well as my blogs, and they prove to be very capable systems for Proxmox, for VMware ESXi, for Docker workloads. I would say the weak point with mini PCs right now is still the remote management. They don't have things like IPMI, iDRAC, like enterprise gear. So there are some trade-offs there, but I think in terms of power efficiency, performance, noise, heat dissipation, they are absolutely phenomenal and have taken my home lab to the next level. Next is migrating to open source virtualization. For years, VMware vSphere was my go-to platform. I loved it. I still do. It has a special place in my heart as far as virtualization hypervisors go. It was a hypervisor that got me excited about virtualization back in the early 2000s. Yes, that is showing my age a bit. But after the Broadcom acquisition, things have definitely changed. Licensing has gotten complicated and a lot of the features home lab users like myself rely on became harder to access. The VMUG program has definitely gotten watered down. You can't really get the licensing unless you're forced into certification and a few other things. And that pushed me to start exploring open source alternatives. And that's when I made the move to Proxmox VE. Proxmox has been a total game changer, especially out of the box. The fact that it gives you clustering, high availability, and built-in backups all for free. Those are the core features that most of us need for a stable, scalable virtualization setup. Now, you don't, at least at this point, and hopefully not in the future, you don't, with Proxmox, have to worry about sudden EULA changes or getting locked out of updates because of a license tier change, like we have so often seen with the VMware by Broadcom solution now after this acquisition. So for me, Proxmox has brought a ton of freedom back to the home lab. I can customize it however I want, try out different storage backends, integrate with open source tools without worrying about vendor lock-in. If you're currently running VMware in your lab and you're curious about making the switch, I have a full walkthrough using the new Proxmox import wizard that makes migrating ESX VMs a breeze. And commercial products like uh, Veeam, uh, Nikivo, other solutions out there, they make that process as well very seamless. So really not that big of a deal to migrate away from VMware vSphere. Now next is adding shared storage with Ceph. The fourth upgrade that changed everything for me was adding shared storage with Ceph. This one goes hand in hand with the move to Proxmox. Uh, Ceph is the open source software defined storage platform that's built right into Proxmox. And it's again, completely free and incredibly powerful. You don't have to worry about being locked into a certain amount of storage and getting getting dinged if you need to add storage in terms of licensing. Before Ceph, I relied on a single node NAS device or standalone storage servers with NFS or iSCSI. These work totally fine and they still do for home lab purposes, uh, but they were limited in a sense of features and functionality and what I wanted to achieve. Once I set up Ceph, Everything became redundant, scalable, and fast, and I don't have to have a dedicated storage appliance. With Ceph, now I can add nodes and drives to simply scale up storage performance and capacity as I need to as my home lab storage needs grow. The best part also is how it seamlessly integrates with Proxmox in the web UI. You've got the built-in wizard that walks you through creating OSDs, monitors, the cluster configuration, and I've got a video on that process as well on configuring Ceph and Proxmox. It takes a little bit of time to learn, but once it's running, it's basically a set it and forget it system that performs really well. Outside of Proxmox, I also use CephFS for Docker Swarm and Kubernetes storage in the home lab. And I feel like having that unified storage backend that works across multiple platforms has made my infrastructure a lot cleaner and easier to manage. And again, if you want to dive deeper into Ceph, do check out my YouTube video on mastering Ceph storage in a Proxmox cluster. Now, next up is embracing containers and container orchestration. This was another upgrade, if you will, in my home lab that totally changed the game. This is the last upgrade on this list that I'm sharing today and probably the most 
what I would say transformative in the last couple of years for me and my learning. Really a time of fully embracing containerization, container orchestration. And if you haven't made the jump yet, you're missing out on one of the best learning experiences. And I really feel productivity boosts that you can give yourself in the home lab. Containers let you deploy services in seconds without the overhead of virtual machines. Now, virtual machines are still needed as container hosts, or that's the way I like to run them. When you think about your applications, applications you run or self-host in the home lab, you no longer have to worry about dependencies or bloated operating system installs. You just simply define the service you want to uh, make use of or self-host. You pull the image and you run it. I started with Docker on standalone hosts, then I moved into Docker Swarm and eventually Kubernetes. All three have their place, I feel like, in the learning journey. And depending on what you're doing, uh, one or all three may fit what you want to do in the home lab. But I feel like container orchestration takes things to another level. It forces you to learn about persistent storage, container networking, and things like ingress controllers, which allow you to terminate SSL and do all kinds of other really cool stuff. And once you understand those, the lab becomes incredibly flexible and powerful when it comes to the apps and self-hosting things that you want to do and learn. So if you're just getting started with Kubernetes also, I recommend checking out my MicroKates Beginners Configuration Guide. I think MicroKates along with MicroCeph is one of the easiest ways to get hands-on with Kubernetes in the home lab and have shared storage with Kubernetes, which is one of those areas that most get intimidated by when they start out and feel like it's really complicated to get that aspect up and running. But with those tools, Absolutely not. It's super easy. So wrapping things up, looking back, these five upgrades, as I thought through what the past few years of my home lab had been, these five upgrades were absolute turning points for me in the home lab, uh, especially moving to 10 gig Ethernet that unlock performance and possibilities that just weren't there before, such as software defined storage. Switching to many PCs made my lab much quieter, cooler and more efficient. Who doesn't want all three of those things? And then migrating to open source virtualization with Proxmox gave me full control, freedom from licensing restrictions and just the wishy-washiness of Broadcom deciding they want to pull free licensing or give you free licensing and then pull it again. Who knows? Adding shared storage with Ceph also brought redundancy and scalability to the setup and taking containers full on and full force in the home lab has been a foundation really for everything else that I have built recently. Now, if you're planning your next round of home lab upgrades, I can't recommend these upgrades enough. Each one opened up not only new hardware potential, but also they opened up new learning opportunities and made my environment more powerful and enjoyable to use. Well, let me know in the comments what upgrades have made the biggest difference for you. Are you focusing on hardware or software improvements or maybe both this year and the coming year, 2026? Thanks for watching. And if you found this video helpful, Please don't forget to like, to subscribe, and hit that bell icon for more home lab content here on Virtualization How To. Well, take care, stay safe out there, keep on home labbing, and I'll see you on the next video.